This is Lon Winters with Graphic Elephants. This is Jimmy Lamp. This is Matt Masala with the RhinestoneWorld.com. And you're listening to the Two Regular Guys Podcast. And you are listening to the Two Regular Guys Podcast. Podcast. Hosted by... My name is Terry Combs RG. Regular guy. And Aaron Montgomery. We're just regular guys having fun and uh, trying to, to make a living in this really cool and exciting industry. I think we all want to succeed 100% of the time seek to understand before I try and make myself understood. Bring a ton of great information. Coming to you live from somewhere dark, dirty, and dank. All right. Well, welcome into the show. It is Friday, August 26, 2022. Is summer almost over, really? I'm Terry (laughs) Combs, and you can find me at terrycombs.com. And I'm Aaron Montgomery, and you can find me over at OurSuccessGroup.com. Uh, today, we uh, we thought we were going to do this on September 30th, but some things changed, so we are able to get it in sooner, so kind of pack it a little bit tighter so it makes a little bit more sense. But uh, we're going to have our very own Eric Campbell back in to uh, not only be the producer extraordinaire that he always is, but uh, also a guest with lots of great information, and uh, we're going to take a topic that was supposed to be one show that turned into two shows that's now turned into three shows i I don't know if we're going to go for four i think we can get it done in three (laughs) but uh, this is an awesome topic uh and i think that's why we we've been able to uh there's so much to talk about around it right so we're talking about non-decorating skills that matter for decorators and and we covered a lot of things around kind of pricing and and running your business and some other things like that and and today we're going to get into kind of that business management side of things so i was joking around with you and eric uh in in a message chat before we got on here today that uh you know i'm just gonna wind you guys up and try to stay out of the way <laughs> <laughs> this topic could be um could be its own podcast so <laughs> yes yes indeed so um it, it's it's gonna be a great discussion i can't wait to get eric in here and and we will get to that very very soon here but uh, as we always do here at the top of the show, we want to just share news items that came across our desk. Uh, before we do that, Terry, I did want to just let everybody know that if you've got something uh, news or noteworthy, please make sure you uh, reach out to us. Uh, email is always best. It's Aaron at our success If you want to reach out to me directly, info at they all go to the same place. So it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but uh, yeah, send us send us that those new di- news items. <laughs> well, <Wow>, misspoke there. <laughs> news, N-E-W-S items <laughs> at info at two regular guys dot com. So and we uh, just lost their spot on (laughs) iHeartRadio. Just did. News. All right. (laughs) So uh, here we go. Uh, Speaking of news items, Terry, uh, you found one for me here. So (laughs) Chromaline Screen Print Products acquired by Sati. So um, very interesting uh, that uh, Sati has acquired Iconics Corporation, expanding its portfolio of supplies for the screen printing industry the purchase includes iconics four business divisions including chromaline uh screen print products as well as iconics imaging iconics industrial inkjet solutions and iconics advanced material solutions so iconics parent company will be saudi advanced chemicals a newly formed subsidiary of saudi americas based in south carolina Uh, Saudi develops and manufactures uh, breathable membranes, chemicals, and equipment for screen printing and other advanced niche markets such as filtration. You've got healthcare, water, food, automotive appliances in that. And then customer electronics. They were founded in Italy in 1935. The company operates 15 sites globally and has about 1,000 employees. So uh, if you want to hit the bit.ly link, if you're watching live, you can scan the QR code up there above Terry, or um, you can also hit the bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y <laughs> slash C-S-P-P-A-S. And uh, we will also have the link for that in the show notes for those of you listening on the podcast side. Uh, just head over to Two regular guys.com and you can uh, read more about that from um, images it, magazine yeah, yeah. interesting a uh, little more consolidation in the industry so yeah yeah i was just thinking you know i think uh you know we know people at, at both companies so uh you know maybe we have to pin them down at uh Pernia yeah. united or something like that and and see if we can kind of get the inside scoop what does this mean is this good bad indifferent that kind of thing so you still have a job. That's what we really want to know. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, you know, now that we're finally going back to trade shows, it's the, you know, a lot of times the the name tags that we wear get kind of flipped over and you always got to like turn it over and go, okay, who are you with? <laughs> who are you with now? 
I mean, how many times have we had somebody say, well, you know I'm not with X, Y, Z anymore, and you look at their tag going, oh, wait, no, I didn't know that. I didn't know that, yeah, exactly. So it, it, it's our industry, right? You can, it's like Hotel California. <laughs> you can never leave. You might switch companies, but you can never leave. So Exactly. Um, all right. Well, hey, Terry, I know you've got a dad joke coming up for us, but let's say hi to a couple people real quick, the folks that are checking in with us this morning. Uh, we've got Cindy King uh, joining us. Thanks for being here, Cindy. And Barb, good morning, everyone, Barb says. Uh, Christine says, good morning, guys. Love when Eric is a guest on the show, as do we. <laughs> and then we've got Josta checking in from Sweden. Always love our international guests. Thank you guys for, uh, you know, being up in the middle of the night or whatever it is for you <laughs> in this moment. Uh, good morning to Sheila and good morning to Carolyn. Uh, Ramona says, always good conversation with the three of you guys. So good morning. Awesome. And uh, Kristen, good morning. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, and then Cindy's just saying hi to everybody. So appreciate that, Cindy. You're like the little social butterfly keeping everybody <laughs> excited and happy. So, all right, Terry. Well, are you ready, sir, for the, the dad joke, the moment we've all been waiting for? It's all I yours. Am, I the am. floor is I yours, think sir. I think it's a pretty good one. And it got the uh, Eric Campbell stamp of, of approval before the yes, show today. Yes, so. so, Well, we'll see, all though, right. as in the delivery, how the head shake goes. Though, so that's, <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> All right. Uh, a sweater I purchased was picking up static electricity, so I returned it to the store. They gave oh, me you another did, one. Did you? Yes, they gave me another one free of charge. <laughs> Sorry. See, I ruined the delivery, but uh, I was laughing too hard because it is a pretty good one. All right. Now, now we have to wait for everybody to to catch up and start the follow-ups to the dad joke so i will try not to giggle too much while you uh, share the next part here terry <laughs> all right before we go any further aaron uh, we want to thank everybody for checking out the two regular guys podcast we are always looking for new guests so if anyone you know would like to join us or you yourself would like to join us go to calendly.com slash two the number two regular guys with your show ideas if you are listening to the podcast version of the show we would appreciate you sharing the two regular guys podcast with all of your industry friends so they can become regulators too and we as always would appreciate you giving us a review on apple podcast spotify iheart radio if we're still there uh stitcher <laughs> Amazon podcast be okay. <laughs> <laughs> or wherever you can do, you do your podcast listening. We are everywhere. And if you're watching us live right now, please join in with your comments and questions about, uh, about the, uh, the running your business and, and, uh, our, our last four categories, Aaron of, yeah. uh, of, uh, of Aaron's suggest or Aaron, uh, Eric's suggested topic on the yes. spur of a moment that turned into three shows. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You gotta love that. Uh, three shows out of a uh, spur of the moment. Uh, Holy cow. Somebody bailed on us last second. And uh, what are we going to do? So, <laughs> who's got uh, a show idea? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Come on. And speaking of that regulators, who's got a show idea, right? So, uh, Eric had that, uh, bitly link. In fact, the QR code, um, I want to show this off. This is pretty cool for those of you watching the video version, the live version up there, uh, right above Terry, other shoulder Terry, because it flips. But um, you can see <laughs> up there. And if you look really hard, Eric's got our little uh, uh, logo, chicken wing logo in there, too. Very, very cool. So, my gosh, we get better every day. This is, uh, it, well, Eric makes us better every day is really what happens. But <laughs> yeah, we, didn't, we honestly didn't do anything. <laughs> no, <laughs> exactly. So speaking of not doing anything, um, let's, let's hear a, a quick word about uh, unlocking your potential um, and where you, you can unlock some things. And, and uh, you know, so you have to do a little bit of something, but uh, I think it'll be pretty powerful for you. So uh, let's hear a quick word about uh, an unlock, unlock Your Potential workshop that my wife and I put together. Hi, I'm Kyleen. And I'm Aaron from Our Success Group. We understand that feeling of knowing something is holding you back. Are you watching others succeed and wondering what they have that you don't? There's a secret locked away inside of each of us, yet we never think about fixing it because it has to be something external from ourselves. It is the limiting belief that everyone wants to just push aside and try to hustle and grind harder to get there. But the truth is, those limiting beliefs are keeping you from asking for help or doing the action needed to move your business forward. The sooner you can identify what's holding you back, the sooner you will start achieving your goals. 
head on over to oursuccessgroup.com forward slash unlock and click the turquoise button. Learn the magic to unlock your potential. We hope you make this investment in yourself and unlock your potential so you can find more meaning and success in your life. All right. Well, check that out, everybody. Uh, our next available workshop is going to be September 12th. Uh, we do it every month. We try to switch up the days and times uh, so that way we can try to catch everybody. But uh, if you uh, will check that out. And then I just popped a coupon code into the chat there for folks. Uh, Thankful is a coupon code that you can use. That's uh, you know, since you guys are taking some time to spend with us here today, with I figured I'd give back a little bit to you guys as well. So there you go. Um, all right, Terry. Well, let's let's do it, and and it'll be awkward as it usually is. So we'll, we'll read Eric, and then we'll tell him to bring himself in, right? So, but <laughs> no, as we talked about before in the chat as well, guys. Uh, Eric really probably doesn't need any introduction, but just in case you happen to be under a rock and um, just coming out and seeing the world for the first time. This fine gentleman, Eric Campbell, is an award-winning machine embroidery digitizer and designer, frequently contributing to the embroidery industry resources, including hosting his weekly show, a, a must-watch, The Take Up. Uh, Eric has done many jobs in the industry from creating and managing e-commerce properties to social media and marketing to establishing and managing relationships between vendors and industry businesses. Eric is an evangelist for the craft, a stitch-obsessed embroidery believer, and firmly holds to constant lifelong learning and the free exchange of techniques and experiences through conversation with his fellow embroiderers. He also is the producer, as you guys know, of, and a frequent contributor, uh, show part like three here right <laughs> today uh, to the two regular guys podcast the uh, in fact the oldest and most listened to industry podcast by the way uh, and he lends his unique embroidery experience to our mix always our go-to guy eric bring yourself on answer <laughs> there you go <laughs> welcome i need to, to have you guys as guests so that you get the big bio read right <laughs> yeah there you go aren't you, aren't you a little jealous the bio read's good it is <laughs> yeah. good it was awesome. you need that get pumped up in the morning <laughs> <laughs> That's, i'm just gonna put my bio and i'm just gonna read it every morning when i wake up right in the mirror <laughs> oh, no, right in the, i almost cut in right halfway through that went okay okay everybody knows who i am <laughs> we got so much we want to talk about let's just get to it <laughs> uh, well right. hey Hey, Eric, we, uh, so we want to carry on from parts one and part two of the, uh, of the, uh, the part two episodes. Uh, we covered five of the nine stated topics that we were going to talk about. And so, so what was, uh, what do you think was the top takeaway from episode two that, that we, you think we should keep in mind? You know what? I actually wanted to flip this on you guys. <laughs> I want to flip this on you guys first. What was your big takeaway? Let's start with you. What's wow. your big takeaway from yeah. this? Yeah. See, when you show producer, you can get away with this kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, so that's I want right. To that's you guys first. I've been talking first all this time. What was your big takeaway? Um. Well, you know, we 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 definitely talked about marketing and yeah. uh, um, uh, and branding, and I, I think branding is a thing that uh, you know. Again, we could have an entire uh, podcast talking about branding, and I think that that uh, people need to have a better understanding. Branding is not your logo, as our good friend Jay Bissell is always saying. Uh, yeah. Branding is, is, is what people think of when, when they see your company name or see your logo. It's, it's, uh, it's who you are as a company. That, that was my big takeaway, I think, is, is we need to spend a, a little bit more time um, thinking about those types of things with our business, not, not just producing goods, but, mm -hmm. but uh, who we are in the industry. Yeah, yeah. All right, Aaron. That's a good one. All right. Yeah, that's I'm, really I'm being I jumped in there. first so that uh... <laughs> you can get it out of the way. I want to hear because I want to get to a through line that I think this has been through all of the episodes. So all right. All right. That's, well, that's why I'm doing this. All right. Well, good. So, <laughs> Terry, very good. I, I like that one for sure. Um, and I totally agree with you that that you know, you said thinking about, right. That, that's the working on your business part that I think we need to do. It seems counterintuitive to say, Oh, I'm going to waste my time coming up with my brand. Well, you're actually going to save time by coming up with it. So I, I will kind of use, go along that same line because I think it was, you know, a, a topic there, but I think it's so important to spend that time working on your business. You know, one of the other things I believe that we talked about was kind of identifying your ideal customer. Right. And understanding who that is. And then also from that, you know, ideal customer, 
then that's your brand, but your brand is really yeah. your values and your personalities. And, and the, the kind of intersection of those two things is kind of where your products and services need to come out of, right? The, the things that your ideal customers need and want the problems you're going to solve for them, the things that you love doing that uh, you can do profitably, you know, that's where, again, the, the products and services come out of the middle. So I, I think the most important takeaway that I wanted people to have from that last one was that, that idea that we do need to spend some time working on our business. You know, I, not to uh, necessarily plug what we're doing in our success group, but, you know, this is so important to me that we're actually putting together a workshop that's happening on September 5th that I'll talk about a little bit later. But we're, we're going through that whole process so that people can build a marketing plan that's going to work for their business in the fourth quarter. It can, it, we're going to give them all the tools, including a workbook that they have a roadmap for the fourth quarter. But a lot of it starts with that, you know, OK, I have to step back think about my business, do this in a strategic way so that when it's time to actually do the things to market while at the same time, probably being in the busiest time of the year for our business, as far as production goes, right? How do I do that efficiently where I'm not just yeah. throwing, you know, all the profits that you make in the fourth quarter should not be spent back with Mr. Zuckerberg on your Facebook ads, right? You need to be able to do that efficiently. And the only way to do that is to spend some time up front, kind of getting to that core of who your ideal customers are and what your brand is. So um, that's my takeaway, Eric. So how do, so how do we a, do? This is the through line. This is, for <laughs> me, at least, this is what I think brings all of this stuff together. And it actually goes into what we're doing today. You wouldn't think management would be part of this. But I think that the through line for all of this is about communication. It's entirely about whether we're we're discussing marketing, whether we're discussing how we define ourselves, if we're talking about, um, honestly, when we get into management and dealing with staff, and we're talking about marketing to customers. All of it, all of this it hinges around communication and listening. So it's it's about listening, knowing an audience, listening to what's actually out there and what people need, understanding someone's needs trying to deal with customer needs as well, communicating clearly when we're talking about either our operating principles to people within our company, or we're talking to people about what we do. It's about clear communication. And it's the same when we're talking about management. I know we're getting into that. We talk about things like approvals. We're talking about things like dealing with our policies, dealing with the way we interact with people. That's also branding. So branding, management, and the way we define ourselves, the way we market ourselves, all of these things, uh, whether within, whether without, it's about clear communication and it's about listening to people and understanding where they're at, meeting them where they're at. So I think a lot of this through line really is about that communication. And I'm going to actually put something a little fluffy into this. And I know sometimes like sounds like we're going to have a self-help kind of discussion here. Some of this has to be there. Part of it is clear com communication with yourself. Uh, the worst thing you can do is lie to yourself in this process. And I think some of us do that in business. We'll be looking at something. We know the wheels are falling off of something. And we kind of just put our fingers <laughs> in our ears. And as long as the machines are moving, we don't la, pay attention la, la, to la. it. <laughs> but especially as we go into talking about management, we know, we know, we have an intrinsic sense of what's going on if we're paying attention at all. We, you, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, Terry, please jump in on this. I, I was just, <laughs> I was just, something popped into my head because I was talking to somebody about this yesterday. It's, it's those managers, when you say lie to yourself, if any sentence you say starts with, I'm not a micromanager, but <laughs> <laughs> you're lying to yourself. You're a micromanager. And the book that we uh, have uh, uh, been making notes about for uh, the last couple of years, uh, All right. how to micromanage your business to success. <laughs> if, you, if you're not hearing enough of the sarcasm in that, please uh, hear the sarcasm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now. Podcast <laughs> listeners, yes, please understand it. No. Uh, especially when yes. we get to the staff part, I have some very strong feelings about that very particular, uh, <laughs> that, that particular kind of way of managing things. I think the truth of the matter is, though, we have that same feeling about branding. We have that same feeling when we're giving our elevator pitch. We know when we're either selling ourselves short or we are selling ourselves, uh, we're aggrandizing ourselves. I've been in that room too, where I'm talking to someone and I know that they are selling out a product of theirs that they're not ready to sell. I have seen that happen live. I've seen somebody trying to tell someone else they can do a thing that they know they're not ready to do. I think more of the problem we have isn't that. More of it is, as Aaron often talks about, limiting beliefs. A lot of us are just worried about either succeeding or failing. Doesn't matter which side of this you're on. You can make yourself crazy either worrying about, you know, <laughs> succeeding so much you have too much work to do, or failing and having somebody upset at you. Both of these things can happen. Or uh, worrying about the kind of reputation you'll get when we talk about marketing and branding. Um, but I've also seen people do the other thing, which is like, oh yeah, no, I can take on that two thousand piece order by Friday. That's fine. Yep. <laughs> 
got it. I got it. I'm your go-to guy. I got it. And I'm watching this go. <laughs> I know you do not have the equipment for this, let alone do you have the bandwidth. Um, you don't these got things it. can happen. <laughs> yeah, don't got it. <laughs> don't, don't got it at all. That, that's the thing. Communication is all the way around. You have to communicate clearly and you have to be uh, willing to say the things that are hard and look at the things that might not be fun to look at. And that's also part of management. You know, that's yeah. the, the trick is not to associate that with yourself so much that like your uh, your emotional state rises and falls with the graphs on your production calendar. That's not we got to get to a point where that's not what happens to us <laughs> at the same time. I'm not going to lie. That's one of those things where it's like, hi, my name's Eric and I've judged myself based on the production of my shop. Um, it's, uh, we can, <laughs> we can, we can go ahead and, and give that up now, but yeah, it's absolutely the case that you not only have to communicate efficiently and clearly to your staff and to your customers, but you do have to have, I hate to say this, but as somebody who's managing or as an owner operator, you have to have hard discussions with yourself about what's really going on. And, uh, develop an understanding and the ability to kind of listen calmly even when things are kind of on fire because <laughs> there will be a time when something's on <laughs> did, fire <laughs> did you guys find it uh, more difficult over the past two years to do your elevator pitch when you had to stand on that little circle in the corner of the elevator <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. Wow. Okay. I don't know. I feel like I'm good on camera. You know, (laughs) I feel like I've got some practice online. The Zoom calls didn't freak me out at all, but there might be reasons for that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. right. Well, so yeah, that's that's great that we kind of tied that all back together. Um, I want to keep us moving forward because I I don't think we need to make this part four. (laughs) No, no. Though we could. I know we could. Um, So, real quick, let's. New, new topics are coming. Come that's on. right. That's right. We're going to have some new topics. In fact, the regulators are going to suggest some new topics today as we go through this, by the way. I, we threw that out there. Positive um, affirmation. And and we want you guys to, you know, ask your questions about things. You know, what things are you stuck on? What, what are you, you know, when it comes to managing your business, Please. where can, what can we answer for you, right? We've got some, obviously, topics that we're going to cover here, but we're, we're looking for input from you guys. And, and then, you know, share your thoughts as well. Um, speaking of that, I'm going to push buttons, Eric, here. Ramona says, I'm a firm believer in learning the technique before putting it out there in the market. Um, mm-hmm. Good. Yosta says, uh, customers are not always right. Take good care of your staff. Happy and s- secure staff bring new customers. So, yeah. So, let, yeah. so let's get into some of that, right? So we've got our last four categories and they're really all kind of around dealing with management and efficiencies. And, you know, I, I typically lean on you guys for sure. You know, Terry's experience and, and Eric, I know you've worked in the shop and have a lot of experience in this too. Um, for a long time, I didn't have a ton of personal experience until my last stop at the wholesale manufacturing company. But again, I was kind of leaning back on you guys here. So I'm going to I'm going to play host here, if that's OK, and, and right. <laughs> just see if I can throw these things at you. And uh, I, I'll just throw out the topic and then let you guys go. So you kind of get your hand over the buzzer when you're ready. And then <laughs> 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 yeah. who's got the answer? No, no. Um, Let's just talk about the overall management of your business first and foremost, the, the actual management of your business as a whole. Well, I, I want to throw out the axiom that I know we're all going to eventually say in one form or another. <laughs> uh, everybody uses this quote forever. I don't even know the origin of the quote at this point because it's been said so many times, but what gets measured gets managed. Peter Drucker. If you never you have that for me. I think it was Peter Drucker, if I remember okay. correctly. Okay. So. I admittedly I don't know because I've heard it repeated as someone else's quote so many sure. times yeah. in so many formats. All all it means to me is that, like I said earlier, you do have to take a look at what you're doing. This doesn't mean we have to do time studies every single day. It does mean that if we don't ever check the oil, we're gonna burn the engine out. Like you, you absolutely need to take time to stop and measure things and some of that it means the kind of uh for for creative people like me or for people who consider themselves creatives which i kind of hate the word but for people who consider themselves creatives it can be hard to want to get to the spreadsheets and manage that stuff now i'll admit in my e-commerce role i'm doing that constantly i'm actually a spreadsheet guy i'm a you know i'm a bar graph guy in the e-commerce part of my my world Uh, but that's the thing if you don't check in if you don't see what's happening you never know what kind of grows up underneath the cover of you continuing, like I said, to make the machines move. So when I talk about managing business, at least for me, a lot of it has to be, <laughs> you got me the quote right there. Yeah, I, love that. yeah. I can do this. <laughs> Only what gets measured gets managed. All right, that's a good one. So, uh, <laughs> suffice it to say, 
I just think that we don't always do this or we can kind of snow ourselves into thinking as long as we keep the machines moving, we might be all right with it. And I think sometimes we're not looking at profitability of jobs. We're not looking at how long we take. We're not seeing if our production curve starts to expand over time. It's kind of like the frog in the boiling water. If the yeah. water's getting hotter, we're getting slower, we're getting less efficient, and we're not watching that as it happens. And that can also be uh, physical assets. If we're not maintaining our, our equipment, if we're not checking in on you know how everything is running, if we're not checking in on how our staff is behaving, how you know attendance is happening, how all of this stuff, it seems like a bunch of disjointed stuff, but we kind of just have to be able to take the temperature of the business and actively be a part of measuring that. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, I, I am not the person who's done this as much as Terry. I would love to hear more <laughs> of what Terry's gonna say about this, because this is something where I've been on the back end of this as an operator, I've uh, definitely seen, and I'll say this too, if you do have staff, having a production manager who is overarching on some of this stuff, I know people don't like to have extra layers in their companies sometimes, but I've, I've had really good luck with people bringing in production managers who are just there to keep things in line, run the calendars, make sure that everyone knows what's going on. You don't necessarily want, and this sounds awful, you don't always want your production people making decisions, they should just be grinding. They're good at production. They should do production. If they're all starting to make decisions about which salesperson's yelling the loudest for their job, you can end up with a whole lot of conflict of yeah. when everybody starts to get together and decides which customer is really the most important. And a lot of these are emotional <laughs> discussions that don't need to be emotional. Yeah, Terry, you, I thought your you son saying... said, yeah, okay. I thought your son said that your, your job was just to babysit people. It was. Is is your job to listen to people complain? (laughs) Oh, my God. That is my job. (laughs) I love that story. All right. So, so Terry, um, talk to us. Yes. (laughs) Well, yeah. You know, uh, and and you're absolutely right, Eric. Uh, Sometimes you have to be your own consultant. And and, uh, I, I... obviously have told this story over the, the 10 years of doing this show every Friday, but, uh, but I, I, was, uh, yeah, <laughs> I was doing a consulting uh, job and, and the, the owner of the company was like, well, Terry, 80% of what you're telling me, we already knew. And I'm like, yes, but you didn't do anything about it. <laughs> so you paid me a lot of money to come in here and, and tell you what you already knew. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, and, and so he didn't need he didn't need to pay me to come and do that. Uh, what he needed to do was take a step back, take a step out of production, take a step off out of the out of the the owner's office, and and just look at your business. And and you know what worked ten years ago, maybe you don't need to do that anymore. And um, again, I'll repeat myself. I was um, <clears throat> I was um, doing a consulting job and. I was in the art department. They had seven artists in the, in their art department. And when they would send film positives out to the production department, they had a log book where they would write down the, the order number, how many films they sent out and the, and, and basically the customer name. And so I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm this consultant. I'm just standing in there watching. So <laughs> with his yellow legal pad, by the way, I'm sure. Of course. Of course. Exactly. <laughs> of course. And, and so I said, uh, I said to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, art director, I said, so, um, you log every, every film that goes out there. Yep. We keep track. And I'm like, um, who looks at this book? Uh, well, I do when I log it. Well, who beside you? Um, no one. And I look up on the shelf and I said, are these all logs of films that you have sent out over the over the years? Yep. Every one of them. I said, well, I need you to stop doing that. <laughs> and she she was like, w- w- what? We, no, <laughs> we have to log everything. No, no, you don't. I need you to stop. She went to the president of the company and says, this consultant guy said, told me to stop logging the logging this all this information. And and he said, well, why? Because he said nobody ever looks at it. And the president of the company goes, do they? Does anybody look at it? And she goes, well, well, no. And he goes, well, it sounds like he's right. Stop doing that. <laughs> you know, it's just make work. At some point in time, I'm sure that they needed that information for whatever yeah. reason. Yeah. But that, that's what, I mean, and, and you, don't have to, you don't have to revamp your entire operation. You know, just kind of look at your shop. What, what's... Uh, What's a, a, a roadblock in your shop? And, and think about that roadblock and study that and say, 
you know what we're going to do this week? We're going to change this one thing and, and it's going to make our shop better. It's going to, we're going to talk about efficiency, but it's going to make us more efficient. But, yeah. um, most of what you need to change about your business, you already know. And I, I want to touch on one more thing. Um, yeah. Eric, when you're talking about bringing in a production manager, yeah, yeah. I have probably heard a hundred times, somebody will call me up and say, Hey, Terry, do you know anybody, uh, that could uh, come in and uh, in a management position, I need somebody to be a working supervisor. And I'm like, working supervisor, do you mean run a press and also <laughs> be in charge? Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. Then no, I don't know anybody that's going to be able to do that because yeah. that's a huge error on your part. <laughs> you cannot do this job. And oh, by the way, do this other job that you know is lacking because you need to hire a manager. Um, but, but uh, uh, you know, commit... 10% of their time. Okay. So it's going to be a 90% uh, production Richard, person. Yeah, so yeah. anyway, so anybody out there thinking about hiring somebody, if you, if you need a manager or a supervisor, let them manage or let them supervise yeah. there. There's plenty to do. That's going to make you money uh, by letting that person do that job. Oh, so. Don't get me wrong. We, we had a great manager that I recall and he uh, was a screen prep technologist. Like he understood screen print very well. He came in, revamped everything, got the ink room settled out. And by the way, organization, and I'm a person who's a little crazy with my organization sometimes. I, I search, not, I don't organize, you know what I mean? I find, I don't, I don't <laughs> fact. Uh, but at the same time, I look at the way he had everything organized and it just made everything faster. And I'm big on that with workflow. I know we're gonna talk about efficiency later. And I mean, physical workflow of garments through a shop, literally changing the way people walk through a shop can change your efficiency. Yeah. Uh, but suffice it to say, we had this manager who came in, his technologist did all this stuff, but he really stayed in production management does it mean he never got on a press? Of course not. If you're somebody who's run a press before and everything is going haywire and there's you just have to operate, somebody might. Yeah. But but Terry's yeah. right. Hire them to be the manager and hire somebody who has, you know, some some time and some thought put into what they're doing who can actually manage production and understands what production takes. And I'll also say this: I've had production managers that come from outside the industry who come in who are just good at managing. Uh, one of them was a warehouse manager for a for a large like shipping company. They came in and it's just somebody who goes, OK, what's this? How long does it take? What's that? How long does that take? And by the time they had gotten the temperature of everything else, they, they knew how to keep things moving. And that was valuable all in and, of, in and of itself. They could pick up, you know, how long things took and what process had to be done. Much rather have somebody who's been in the industry. But it's surprising how well somebody who's really great at management can pick up whatever industry they're in if they're the kind of person who can keep production running. Though I do want to bring in a comment from Ramona, and I like this one. This is also true. Uh, what Eric says also applies to one-person shops, maybe more so because you need to be aware of your time budget. Yeah. If you've ever heard me talk about uh, when you're doing art projects versus work and profitability, this is one of the things that happens. Creative people like to do creative projects, but we will spend way more time on something we're enjoying <laughs> than something that's making money sometimes. <laughs> and we got it. That's another one of those awareness things. And I think uh, actually Aaron's really good at this. Uh, Aaron's good at lifting out of a business and taking that overview, kind of having that, you know, 30,000 foot view of what's going on. And I think that's also what Terry said. We have to occasionally step back outside of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, get on your step ladder and, and put your head up above the fray of what we're doing and say, what's actually going on on the floor. And that's even with ourselves. We have to step out of our role and say, all right, if I were coming into this, like Terry said, be your own uh, consultant. If I were coming into this cold from somewhere else, what would I point at and go, that guy's screwing this up. That guy's not taking care of this <laughs> job. That's not being dealt with, right? We have to we have to be able to do that. And it, it does mean some, you know, mental gymnastics, but I think it's really worthwhile to do. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, I, I said that I was going to not talk, but, you know, you guys knew uh, in advance that that just couldn't happen. <laughs> no, no. Come on <laughs> Eric, in, man. Eric even said as much. But you know, I had an opportunity to actually uh, get to – visit face-to-face -face with uh, one of the o OSG members yesterday. Uh, they just happened to be in town, and we, we took an opportunity to do this. And, and that was what the lot of, a lot of discussion was around. You know, um, it's a one-person shop, and, and you know, trying to be all things to everybody, right? We know that that ends up being nothing to nobody. And, and what happens is you get so overwhelmed, right? And, and so I think this is really great points that you guys are making about, yeah, you got to step back. You got to look at it like a consultant. You got to... 
you know, we're human, so we're always going to make decisions based on emotions. No matter how logical we think that we are, our decisions will always be based on emotions, but the emotions will get the best of us, right? The emotions will just go wherever the whim takes us if we don't have information to allow ourselves to kind of go, okay, how do I get to that right emotion, right? And so if you don't know, you know, the Ramona talked about your time budget, right? Where are you spending your time and, and what Eric was talking about with, you know, doing fun projects. Cause I, I would say, you know, if you're finding yourself doing a lot of fun projects, then you need to figure out how to make money doing that. Right. And, and kind of figure, you know, kind of go that route. But, um, I think there's, there's a lot of meat to be had in there about just stepping back. And, and I always talk about how counterintuitive this is to people's businesses because, you think, oh gosh, I just don't have time to do X, Y, and Z to, to do that consulting work to, you know, and so that's why sometimes people do hire a consultant or, you know, they're going to become part of a group like our success group to kind of give themselves the framework to be able to do that and, and hold themselves accountable to it. But you got to do it. I mean, that's why I said it's so counterintuitive because it seems like you're actually spending more time, but you're actually going to get your time back because you're going to be ultimately more efficient, which you guys talked about. So, um, and we'll wow. be talking about this again at the end of the year when we do planning for 2023. <laughs> there you go. Always, exactly. Always. Um, one other quick comment I'm going to bring in here. Christina was talking about Terry uh, and, and his job being listening to the people complain. That's her job, too. So the, you, <laughs> that, that happens soul. a lot. Yeah. And then Yosta says, take help from outside is really good when most of staff is family. Um, yep. you know, I think just in general, right? It just having having a different set of eyes can bring, I, I always enjoy having people around me that don't have any idea about what I'm doing because that kind of newbie perspective or that perspective from somebody that doesn't have all the blinders on that, you know, we get mm -hmm. so wrapped into it that we can't see everything else around us. And so having somebody that has no clue come in and go, huh, this doesn't seem to make sense to me. Okay. <laughs> you either figure out why it does actually make sense or you go, ah, they're kind of right. Kind of like Terry and the, and the, the log books, right? It, it made sense to them. It was a safety blanket for them. Right, but sure. at the end of the day, there was no use to it. Um, and therefore they were just wasting time doing things that didn't get them closer to the, their idea of success. So, well, and you can do it the other direction too. If you see yourself consistently, like, like Terry said, roadblocks. And I talk about this as being either a, uh, when I'm talking about workflow, the thing that I'm try, trying to avoid every time is reversions, where it's like the job's coming down the pipe, and then suddenly I have to go back to sales, back to someone else, back to whoever did the art. I'm trying to stop as many of those as possible. If I can keep something flowing in one direction from the order process right through the pickup process, that's what I want to do, no reversions. And the thing is, you'll find yourself doing these things. And funny enough, a lot of it centers around telling people, when do you stop? When do you get up from your desk? When do you walk to somewhere else? Because they remember that. They remember how many times a day they get up to go talk to somebody or they have to run and go do something. And honestly, you can say, how many times do you have to message somebody or call somebody to get things done? Watch how many times you're doing that and what it's about. Make a note of that. And that sounds like, really, I'm going to stop and make a note of every time I call somebody about stuff. Trust me, you'll find it. You'll find the leak. This is, like a, the, this is like the soapy water on the gas line. You will find the leak if you stop and take those small notes and you don't know what small changes might make a huge yeah. difference to your end time. Just like we talk about in uh, digitizing with efficiency, whenever I've discussed that and I'm like, okay, if you save this many color changes, now think about that over a hundred runs of 12 pieces. How many minutes did you save? How many, you know, how much time did you save? Same thing with density. I always talk about yeah. stitch density, stitch counts. We reduce our stitch counts by 18% and suddenly we have one more run of that same order every day. One more production run of that shop. And it's like, imagine getting back like 20% of your stitch count. Yeah. And that's from small changes in digitizing. The same thing happens with management. The same thing happens with movement through a shop. The same thing happens with measuring these kinds of things. You can have this small moment of taking that pause. And yeah, you're not doing production when you take the pause. But if you do that note taking, you do a little bit of that measurement and suddenly little changes to your the way you handle things, little changes to the way you communicate, little changes to the way you set up your file systems yeah. might get you back massive time over the course of a of a year. Yeah. It's hard to see it unless you stop and take that moment to really evaluate this normal day that you've been going through over and over again. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Well, let's, I want to get a couple more comments in here. Aaron says <laughs> business ADHD, and then always nice to have another set of eyes on it. Uh, yep. Christina has got a, a comment and I'll, I'll just read the front end of it. Sometimes when you do the same thing every single day, you just keep, keep on keeping on and things yeah. don't change. Taking a yeah. step back from a fresh perspective is, is important. So I want to, I, I use this analogy as a, if you're out there with an ax and you're trying to chop down a tree and you really just have this blunt ax and, you know, could you chop down that tree over, just keep hammering away with that blunt ax over and over again? Potentially, I guess if you, you know, had enough staying power and you were strong enough, you could just bludgeon the thing to death. But what happens if you were to just stop, take a moment, and sharpen the axe? And then hit the tree for a little bit. Up, oh, and it gets dull again. Okay, stop, sharpen the axe. And, and that's what we're talking about here. Just, just yeah. sharpen that axe a little bit, step back mm-hmm. from it, you know, do something that's not exactly chopping down the tree so that you can chop down the tree faster, and that's how you get your time back. That's how you become more efficient, so on and so yeah. forth. So, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Okay, you guys. Well, unless you guys have any more things there, I want to, <laughs> we're we're going to turn this into four parter. I know it, but <laughs> let's not. <laughs> uh, are you guys ready to move on to the next yeah. one? Okay. Yes. I think all they're right. all so, interlinked anyway. We're kind of covering are. them all at the yeah, same and time. And we have hit a lot of these, but I think <clears throat> yeah. there's going to, I know you guys have specific in each of these areas. So, yep, yep, yep. Um, all right. So number two, and again, hands over the buzzer, whoever wants to go first here. Number two <laughs> Terry is can go m- first. I like <laughs> management class. of your staff. So yes, we, we'll go ahead and throw it to Terry here first. But, okay. Terry, management of your uh, staff, go. A <laughs> couple of things. Uh, expectations. You, you mm-hmm. have to, you have to tell uh, people on your staff, what you expect of them. I, I, I start, I, this seems to always happen when I start a new uh, job as a production or plant manager. Oh, you know, you're going to need to get rid of Jim over there. And, well, why is that? Well, Jim's not doing a very good job. Well, well, um, have you talked to Jim about what, what you expect him to do? Well, no, but he's just not meeting my expectations. But you never told him what your expectations are. <laughs> then no, I'm not going to fire that person. But I will have a conversation with him about expectations, and then let's see if that person, um, uh, because you know, one person, uh, one person over here could print screen print ten shirts and think they're the best printer on the planet. This person over here. Uh, does the same print in the same amount of time and thinks I'm going to lose my job any minute now because I'm not doing uh, not doing uh, my job efficiently and and yeah. and all you have to do is say this job should take two and a half hours to set up print and tear down that's the expectation that's for them to understand how what you what what measurement you're using for um, for that particular job. A uh, couple other points I want to make. I know we're, we don't have a ton of time. Oh, uh, you need to anyway, trust your employees oh. to do their job. Uh, and I know that's really hard for a lot of people. Uh, you know, I, I yes, you I know. Managers. <laughs> yeah, I, right, right. I know you can do this better, but you doing it is not the solution. That's not how we grow the business. You, you have to, if you trust people to do their job, the, 99% of people come to work wanting to do a good job. So set the expectations and let them do the job. Trust them to do the, to do the work. Um, and, and the last thing I want to mention is listen to your employees. And I know that's hard for some people. Uh, do it because I say so is not, uh, not a good response. Um, who, who knows more about what they do day to day than the people that are doing that job? If, if you want to be more efficient in the way you produce, uh, talk to the people who are doing the job. What, what's holding you up? What's the roadblock in your day? And, and what can we do to resolve that? So, and, and here's the rub though. When you listen to the employees, you have to do some action, whether it is implement what they suggest or explain to them why you're not implementing what they suggest. But if you just go on, you know, you, you have that pizza meeting and and uh, go around the room. What 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 one thing could we do to make your job better? And and, you know, people aren't going to say much at first, but the more um, more you ask, the more they're going to respond. But if you walk out of that meeting and nothing happens, they're never going to suggest anything to you again. 
because you obviously were, were checking the boxes. Uh, Terry says you should listen to your employees. So I'm going to go in today and spend a half hour listening to the employees. And then I'm going to go on and do what I normally do every day uh, without remembering one thing that was said to me. So um employees, like I said, they come to work and want to do a good job. Explain to them what that job is and uh, and and let them help you to be better at that job. So yeah. can, I'll step can I off my a, soapbox. There you go. <laughs> I want to add one thing to the, the last part that Terry said there really quick, because um, I think this could also be really helpful. And I found it useful when I've managed employees. Uh, Terry was the exception, but that's a whole different story. But uh, <laughs> no, it is... It, giving that opportunity to listen, but then also giving them an opportunity to be part of the solution, right? And like I said, even if it's saying, you know, we're not doing that and here's why, because I think if you just open up the floodgates and just say, complain, right? <laughs> you know, the, the, like Terry was having to do, just listen to people complain all day. Because I know Terry also did this where they would be, you know, come in and then he would go, okay, well, what's the solution? And then, you know, pretty soon they'd step into the office, they'd look at Terry, Terry would look up and then they go out and figure it out. Right. So without words being said, <laughs> exactly right. you know, and then they stop coming. Right. So the, make sure you also take it that other step and, you know, OK, what what could you what what do you need to do your job better? And, and what would be the solution yeah. to that? Right. And here's the here's why that's a challenge. But if you can help us figure out how to overcome that challenge, you know, whether it's, you know, we don't have the funds to be able to do that or, or whatever. Right. So. Um, I think once you give them an opportunity to also be part of the solution, that's also going to be really powerful for them. So. Absolutely. Exactly. So. All right, All right, Eric, your turn, sir. So I'm literally, I have banners and I have something to lock this down. Oh this God. is how this bad is this awesome. is. I have, I have key terms because I think that I'm, I can bring all this together into at least what I feel like for me was the big changing point. Um, I believe I was reading a book from Charles Duhigg about the power of habit was probably when I got some of this together. I was reading so many books at the same time. Now I've forgotten all the people who kind of came together to help me get this kind of attitude. But here's the thing. When we're talking about anybody we're managing, we're talking about employees, what kind of motivation do we want, want them to have is the is something we should be thinking about. These are the two words I want you to think about. Intrinsic versus extrinsic. What does this mean? Intrinsic motivation comes from within. It's when I feel like I want to do a thing. I am motivated from myself, from my own sense of purpose, from my own sense of wanting to do something to move to work. Extrinsic is I've got a big stick and I'm going to hit you if you don't want to do this right. I'm going to punish you if you don't do this. I need to drive you at all times. The best employee you can ever have is someone who's intrinsically motivated to do the work, right? So how do we get somebody to be intrinsically motivated? And this goes right into all the things that, honestly, everything that Aaron and Terry said was a, a down-to-earth version of this thing that I'm going to make sound way too scholarly for no good reason. All right, so, so here's what I'm going to say. Uh, what I always say is get them amped. And there's a reason why this is, this is uh, capitalized, the AMP. Every worker who's going to be intrinsically motivated needs some autonomy, which means some ability to make decisions for themselves about how they get the work done. So yeah, expectations are absolutely critical. If they're hitting the expectations, don't worry about which side of the desk they're putting their pen cup on. Let them do the work in a way that they need to do it that makes sense to them as long as they're hitting the expectations and the quality of their work is good. It's okay to measure what the output is, but autonomy lets them have a little bit of that feeling. And also, if you crush somebody's autonomy, watch them become motivated by anything but their own mind. Because if they think that you're going to consistently come down on them for things that don't matter, for things that don't affect production, they're going to stop being intrinsically motivated really quickly. Second they're thing. It's going to be CYA, Eric. I mean, yeah, it, for it's sure. all just going to go to CYA. CYA. Yeah. It, watch the blame game erupt in your company if you start doing that. Yeah. Watch yeah. everybody point fingers because it will happen immediately. Yeah. Um, next thing is mastery. Everybody wants a path to mastery, to doing something that they do better. And if you encourage that and you celebrate mastery in people and you let them have the time to learn. So this is having some structured play or learning time where they're getting to just use their skills and get better. This is also like Aaron kind of said with the and I think it goes back to autonomy as well, where they have a chance to suggest the solution and you give them some space to work on that solution. That's both mastery and autonomy to some degree. So yes. a path to mastery, a path to making themselves the expert at what they're doing. And to feel like there's advancement possible. If you feel like there's no advancement possible or that you're just doing something that anyone could do that could be replaced by a machine tomorrow, it's very hard to become intrinsically motivated to do that. Um, the next part is purpose. 
not everybody's going to be, you know, chaining this all to a large, you know, charity or some massive purpose outside of just making the business run better. This could be so that we can get to a place where we can give raises, so that we can get to a place where we can buy new equipment. This can be smaller versions of the word purpose. It's always have to have the capital P on it. But for me, I think that it should be something slightly larger. Either it's something for your community, it's something for the local community of your shop, but something that is a purpose beyond more orders, more grinding, more numbers, more money, because it just isn't enough for most people to keep intrinsically motivated. So that's my big thing. You want people to be intrinsically motivated rather than just the stick. You don't want them just to fear the stick. You want them to get up and go, you know what? I've got some ideas and I want, I myself want to get out there, make some choices that I thought of, get better at my job, and that it's going to contribute in a meaningful way to something that we're all aiming for. Nice. And I think that's how we get people who are self-starters. People say they love a self-starter and then they micromanage them into being like what Aaron said, uh, doing the CIA dance and pointing fingers. People <laughs> yeah, love exactly a self-starter right. until they come up with an idea that you didn't want to do. Yeah. You, you know, Eric, <laughs> Eric, I love when you said celebrate the mastery because yeah. Yeah. That, that's another point with the employee. When you have employees, you, you need to recognize success more yeah. than you need to focus on people who are having failures because everybody wants attention. And yeah. if, if the attention is attained by uh, by uh, by, you know, not reaching your production goals or by by uh, missing every other Monday at work. And, and, and that's and, and you see that that's what the owner or the manager or the supervisor is focused on. Sometimes people will, will tend to go that direction because because of just the sheer fact of recognition. But yeah. but what you need to do is, like you said, celebrate the mastery, celebrate yeah. uh, success. Um, you know, uh, Jim has uh, exceeded. Uh, production goals every every week for the the past two months and and by the way so hey Jim here's two movie passes to AMC theater uh, for you and your uh, your significant other and uh, and uh, then ev everybody wants movie tickets you know <laughs> what did yeah. it cost you twenty bucks oh, but uh, but I mean not twenty it's bucks about anymore the character. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what's what's the character that you want to have between someone who's managing and someone who's working do you want it to be adversarial do you want it to be uh the manager's riding my butt again today i've been i'm trying to stay very clean because boy in the shop that's not how it went but do we want it to be because i i've been in shops where literally every department was adversarial against the other departments the art department's lazy and the salespeople don't get back to production and know what's going on and the production people aren't aren't firing on all cylinders and they keep making mistakes and every every group pointing at each other when from the outside do you want us to know what the customer sees a mess we don't yeah. look like we're put together we don't look like we know what we're doing we don't look professional and there is no no salesperson has ever gotten off the hook by going yeah, yeah my production people just suck that's why your order's not done okay <laughs> if your production people suck you suck sorry <laughs> that's how that works that stink is on you if your production people suck you suck if your uh if your accounting people don't get the billing right and now you're having a fight with your customer, you suck. It doesn't matter who's the face. It doesn't matter who is the backbone of the thing. If there's a bad part of that interaction or something breaks apart, the customer ultimately is not here to listen to your therapy session on why you guys can't get along. <laughs> it, yes. it, it's going to reflect in your, and we talked about branding before, that's your brand. Your yeah. brand is now the shop that can't get itself together. Yeah. Do we exactly. want that? And do we want to be to have to do that? Also, as a manager, do you want to be you know, there with the coach whip all day? Do you want to be over the backs of all your people yelling and screaming? Or do you want to say, all right, be a, a stabilizing force when something goes wrong? You say, all right, let's examine that and make sure it goes it goes better the next time. Not happy, but here's the expectation of how I want that to change and what we need to be doing for this to work. And then when there is a win, or even if we just correct a problem, it doesn't have to be that we're exceeding all, all all of our expectations, we can say, all right, we had a problem and we've corrected it. Good job. That's what we're here to do. We're here to get a little better every day. Yeah. Which I, voice do you want to be? Sure. And to add on to that, you know, we talked about celebrating the wins and, and yeah. the recognition, you know, uh, Ramona had said uh, negative attention is still attention. Some will take what they can get. Here's the other side of this too, that if, you know, if you're the owner or manager that you should be thinking about as well is, you have to then also lead by example. Like I was talking to a, a friend of mine that's in one of my mastermind groups the other day, and she was talking about some of the progress that she was kind of making. 
you know, but she had, you know, she had the, the carrot and the stick, right? She was shooting for this goal and, and she could see the carrot, but all she was doing was just beating herself on the back with the stick. And, and I said, you know, uh, well, I think you're probably not getting there because you're not stopping to celebrate the wins yourself, right? You, you got to take a bite of that carrot every once in a while to make sure it's still what you want. And, and so I, I think the same thing can happen there. You know, if you're leading by example, right? If you're, you're that manager that's always just like, oh, we missed our numbers. Oh, this, that, the other thing. Guess what? <laughs> like you said, that's going to be what happens for, for everybody else too. So, you know, you, you got to find the positives even when there's challenging times and, and, and then find that balance, right? So you can't take all the credit, but at the same time, you have to also realize that you're part of that team too. Well, yeah. the, the personality of a company uh, is a direct reflection of the owner or manager. So if you call some place and they're like, uh, they answer the phone and go, uh, you know, XYZ company, please hold. And you're like, well, gosh, that, you know, I, I just had a really quick question and, or, or, uh, you know, the, just a, a poor attitude. Guess what? That is a reflection of, of you as the owner or you as the manager. So, uh, however your staff reacts with customers and with each other is absolutely a direct reflection of you and how you manage the company. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, especially if you're not setting ex expectations. That should be yeah. part of the expectations you set is your branding. Say, I want us to be the company that acts like this with customers. Yeah. I mean, there's room for different styles. There are. But at the same time, sure. we have to understand that it is part of that. And the other thing I didn't actually bring up and I wanted to bring up in this is that exactly what Terry said, feedback. Feedback is critical, clear, and also quick feedback. You can't wait three months to talk to somebody about how they've changed some things. You can't do that. You have to be giving feedback pretty reliably and regularly. Regular, clear feedback from the people who are in charge is important. That is just you mean like your yearly review for the past eight months. You've been doing something that's really irritating me. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing will make somebody more angry than the fact that they've been putting effort into a thing that you don't value for a long period of time and you didn't say anything. Yeah. Ask me how I know from both sides of that argument. <laughs> I have done that from both sides of the argument, both yeah. with people who were essentially down the stream from me in production and with somebody on the other side of me where I've been putting effort into a thing that no one cared about. Yeah. I would it's ask you that, but that I believe would be another show. So yeah, <laughs> let's, let's <laughs> not. All right. I, I just want to add one more thing in here because you guys have hit on this too. And I, I want to make sure that this point comes across. So all this stuff, you know, you're talking about brand and, and Eric even mentioned purpose in there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you talk about brand and that personality and what people see. You, none of that stuff can be defined. None of that stuff can be carried out. Nobody knows what to connect with unless you go all the way back to the very foundation, the very ground floor of what are your values? What mm -hmm. is important to you as a company, right? And then you're going to end up with a mission statement, all that other, but, but just kind of going, what, what are, what, what are the values, right? We, we might think, oh, we want to do good work and, and deliver on time, right? That's the minimum requirement according to Terry, which is absolutely true. And, but what makes you unique, right? What are, what are those values? What, what does good work mean to you, right? It, it could be that you're getting everything out and the customers are generally happy, or it could be that sure. you are the very best in town and people come to you uh, to learn at, at the foot of the master, so to speak, right? Those are different values, but they all can seem like the same thing. So I think that's, that's something that I want to make sure people understand is that if you haven't taken the time to figure out what your core values are, then you're always going to be shooting from the dark and, and it, it'll be yeah. tough. Though it's okay to find those out. It's okay to revisit those. It's the same thing. Oh, when, we're, when we're measuring things, you revisit and redefine. That is totally fine. You can't steer a parked car. You are going to have to make a move for anything to happen. And you may, you'll reveal those things sometimes as you go. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're, if you're just starting, you know, like, oh, I'll just let it happen. Right. Then what's going to happen is the strongest personality, which could yep. be a could be somebody else temp worker, right? <laughs> um, their values are going to be what you then now have to then try to figure out how to change. True. Right. So yeah. as the owner and manager, you definitely have to have a starting point. And then, like you said, evolving. I, I believe everything totally in business is cyclical, right? We, we always are, you know, it, yes, you're shooting for a particular goal that's out here, but it's really about the process and it's just continuously yeah. going through the different cycles um, over and over. So, 
Well, and that's the thing. We were going to start talking, and I know we're going to probably cut some of this short, but I think a lot of this goes into the other stuff we want to talk about, which were yeah. kind of day-to-day -day operations and efficiency. Let's do and it. I think, <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to roll right into it because I think this makes sense to do, do so. Um, we're talking about that cycle. You do have to kind of get in love with the process, and that's something that we understand. The first thing I've, I've told people, I'm like, all right, they're go shooting for a goal, and I know that they're not working on the process, and you talk to them, and you're like, all right, so what are you going to do at once that goal's met? And they freeze. <laughs> they freeze solid. They don't know because they haven't thought beyond the immediate goal. And I'm like, you know, you're you're probably going to still want to operate your business after this one goal is met. So it's okay to continue thinking about your process. Like, yeah, we got to meet the goal. Yes, sometimes we pull out all the stops to meet the goal, but we also can't torch the place while we're trying to meet the goal if it doesn't, you know, because it's not going to make sense to your sustainability. And I think, funny enough, we use sustainability to talk about, you know, ecology. We'd use that word for that. But sustainability is also our ability to sustain ourselves and our business, to sustain our motivation, and to keep the business running in a way that it mm -hmm. can run. And a lot of that is uh, not wasting energy, being efficient. And making sure that our operations, like we said, day to day are kind of not only efficient, but that they're serving the goal. All of this goes back to that measurement. All of this goes back to taking that time to take a look at things and to keep an eye on and redefine what we're doing as we go. Yeah. But that does mean, yeah, sometimes we're going to have to stop and say, all right, yes, there's a goal. There's still a goal beyond that. If we're going to keep operating, then it's really a day to day improvement. It's I mean, Kaizen is what we always talk about, doing yeah. a little bit better every day small improvements that add up um, and a good friend of mine creative and brilliance uh, brian bailey always says uh what you're looking for is a mug modest usable gains and i kind of <laughs> like that one it's just like no we just need something that is going to be it it's a gain it's an improvement but it's modest and it actually is useful if you yeah. do that everything else is going to fall in line as long as you're purposeful and you have the big roadmap day to day though what's really going to make the difference are these modest usable gains these small useful things we do that increase our ability or increase our efficiency yeah well real quick when talking about you know falling in love with with the process mm -hmm. an interesting thing that uh, i read is that um olympic athletes who've been to the olympics uh mm -hmm. post olympics they have an unnaturally large uh number of people that are clinically depressed mm -hmm. uh, olympic athletes and because it is that right they they reach that goal and then that's what they've been now doing what? since they were a kid Right. Yeah. Mastering this thing. And then they get done with going and doing that thing. And and even gold medalists have the same same thing. So it's not based on their actual result. It's based on the fact that now what do you do next? Right. And so I think what Eric just said, they're kind of falling in love with that process and, and continuing to make those modest gains. I love that from Brian as well. Uh, you know, you, know, that, you could put that literally on a mug. I mean, uh, we're, we're decorators on. here. Just wait. <laughs> Just you can't wait. because of the you can't see it, <laughs> can't but see it's there. The screen, but modest, useful gains that is actually on the mug. That's something that uh you can't see the the rest because of the green screen. So I'll just try and get the lettering, the bottom lettering of it. Yeah, <laughs> modest, useful gains. Uh, yeah, that is that that is absolutely a thing that should go on your mug. Yeah, what's in your mug? <laughs> <laughs> what's in your mug? Uh, is in your mug. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, Terry, talk to us a little bit about, and then Eric, any other sure. things to add after that too? Uh, um, I, I know we're over into bonus time, but this is a show worth it. So day-to-day -day operations, yeah. efficiency, talk to us about that. Um, yes. Day-to-day -day operations, build systems and, and, and so that, so that it's repeatable so that a new employee can come in and understand what the system is. But uh, I, I want to speak more, more importantly to efficiency yeah. because yes, we all want to be more efficient at what we do. There's always room for improvement. I don't care what production floor you have or, or, or art department or whatever, but be honest with yourself. We're going to talk about lying to yourself again. Mm -hmm. You can't base your production schedule. You can't base your pricing. You can't base anything on what you wish you were able to produce. You have to base it on what you're doing today. Can you improve it? Yes. But today I'm capable of doing this in, in, in so many shops. I mean, be two weeks, a month behind schedule. Why? because you're not being honest with yourself about what you are right now today are capable of doing. And then, then you start making those gradual improvements, getting rid of those roadblocks to make yourself more efficient. But, but you, you got to start with what you got, you know? Yeah. So. yeah. Eric, I'm going to jump in it because I, I think I can be quick and then you can close us out with your thoughts on this. No worries. No worries. Um, I, I what Terry was just talking about there, right. And, and that efficiency and stuff like that, I actually, um, 
at the end of the skills USA competition, you know, had all those young people there and it was really incredible to watch them and stuff like that. But I, then I had a chance to kind of debrief afterwards. And then the one key point I wanted to get across to them and then all of their teachers that were there to help them understand kind of in our industry, uh, what we need to be looking for and how we can do this in a, like Terry talked about a, a processed way is I said, think about it like this. Think about it like, when you're actually doing the work in your business, the the making of the things, even the dealing with your customers, things like that, but the the working in your business part of stuff, think of it like being on a pit crew for a race team. Right? And they're trying to go as incredibly fast as they can. I mean, every second counts. So it's really important that they go as fast as they can. So they've done lots of prep work to make sure they have all the tools in the right place and, and they're boom, boom, in and out. But here's the important part is they cannot mess up, right? They can't miss a lug nut. Otherwise the car is going to crash. So as a, as somebody that's doing production or, or just running your business, the working in your business part, think of it like a pit crew. How do you do the work up front to make sure that you've practiced, you've got all the right motions and movements and things are in the right place at the right time and, and, and you're efficient, but then go as quickly as you can. So ganging things together is one way to do that. If you're a sublimator, for example, and stuff like that. And then make sure that you get it right though. Don't go so fast that you're just kind of throwing your hands in the air, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the roping of the, the cow in the calf roping thing. So anyhow, I just wanted to share that as my little, tidbit oh, yeah. on uh, efficiency so no, I've, I've got a couple of junior, that's from aaron's junior rodeo days yeah right? there you that's go up in prescott yeah. <laughs> there true <you> story go. <laughs> <laughs> well and here's here's how i'll put it uh number one absolutely you have to kind of make sure you're taking stock of these things but i, I think the process is great because there are times where when we are just doing the thing that we need to do we're doing our jobs individually and or in our different departments when we really just don't need to be bothered with decisions. And I know that sounds like we talked about being creative and being aware and everything, but you guys know when it's time to get production done, the last thing you want to be doing while you're standing at the machine is changing how things are set up. You want to yeah. set up and run. By the time something gets to the production stage, I should not be questioning colors. I should not be questioning, like every decision should be made that is necessary to one department before things move on to another department, even within yourself. If I'm running a job myself, I don't want to be at the embroidery machine changing all my thread colors unless something absolutely has to be changed for a reason. Mm -hmm. If at all possible, I want to know all my colorways. I want to know all my setup. I want to know what stabilizers are necessary. I want to know all my positions. I need to know everything about that job, and I shouldn't be making decisions once I'm pushing buttons to make the machine run. And that sounds funny. You're like, okay, you want to be ever to be autonomous, but then you want all these decisions made. Decisions about process, where things should go, should not happen at the stage of production they should be happening ahead of time and if we have a process it's not that we can't change it but if we know what stages we go in we understand that approvals go through these three steps if we understand that production goes from these three steps and if we have our setup in line like aaron said the pit crew it becomes like a well-oiled machine it doesn't mean we don't make our own decision it doesn't mean we don't trust people what it means is we give them the support to not have to make decisions that are easily processed we should be reserving our decision-making power for things that are important, not for the things that are easily part of the process that we can systematize. And exactly. the other thing I like to bring up, we're talking about, um, I've talked about workflow quite a lot. Uh, yes, informational workflow is super important. Mm -hmm. Every department should present all the information and stuff that it produces to the next department as if they were going to fall off a cliff. If you were not going to exist at the moment you hand off this job to the next person, they should still be able to do the job. That's the best version of things. You're going to have crosstalk. It's going to happen. But the best version is that I produce a product. I'm producing my product as the salesperson to hand to the artist. And that product is all the information the artist needs to do their work. And we go down the chain like that. However, the other thing I want to make sure people think about is, is not only physical workflow through the shop, how garments move through a shop, walking around boxes and tripping over crap will always make your day worse and take longer. I've seen entire, uh, entire shops where they have one printer in a shop and everybody's walking back and forth to get paperwork. And they're walking sometimes hundreds of feet every time they need something to sign off on or to put in a box. And it's ridiculous for the cost of a printer and networking. It's ridiculous for people to cross the <laughs> shop 50 times to do a job. But the other thing I always want to make sure for people is to get your station set up 
where the ne the necessary tools and equipment and supplies for one station should be just about within arm's reach, if at all possible, which means sometimes we have double, triple, or each machine has its own copy. And the thing I always talk about this is uh, what professional chefs do. It's another term that I think is fun. Uh, I like words for things. I like to have my fancy words for all these <laughs> concepts because I think it helps me remember things. Mise en place which means that everything is in its place. If you blindfold me, I could reach for the ne the uh, screwdriver I needed to, to change my needle. I could reach for it and it would be there and I would put it back there. It also means working clean. Each person who's in a department works clean and puts things back where they come from, cleans up their station so that if you put a blindfold on them right now, they could reach for the normal backing for a left chest behind them and grab a slice of that. And it wouldn't be a problem. That kind of preparation just makes the process of production easier, and you can do it in any department. You can have that kind of mise en place attitude, even when it comes to things like your information. If you know what folder things are backed up to, if it's centrally located, everybody has access to what they're supposed to, they always know right where to go. And as long as everyone follows that process and it's systematized, no one's guessing about the kind of menial stuff that has to happen. There are processes that just have to happen that are part of what we do that don't need to be thought of, that don't need to be a, com a committee every time we do them. Those things should be processed and in their place. Yeah. I love it. Yep. I and, and, too. and a very nice little bow on this, uh, yep. yeah, this right? three-part series. Beautiful <laughs> bow on it. Um, it the, the one thing I did want to point out is, is Terry, Go I would like it. you to have banners next time for all of your points, please, if you could. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me I, your points ahead of time and I'll make you banners, man. All right, I feel, I feel, uh, I feel uh, very continental with, uh, with uh, your French uh, phrases. Up on I, this. I tried. I tried. <laughs> I know there's somebody out here whose pronunciation beats the heck out of mine because I, <laughs> I know about that much French. I know about those three words, but um, <laughs> there you go. I tried. Uh, <laughs> all right, Eric. Well, what's what's coming up for you here, sir? Where, where can people get more Eric Campbell? Because we all need more all Eric right. Campbell in our lives. I mean, I don't know. I need a little less. <laughs> but everybody, <laughs> everybody else, if you want to get, catch a little bit more of me today, uh, the big thing is to check out the take up today. It is uh, episode 125, Personalization of Machine Embroidery, where we will be discussing the norms of naming that I've encountered through my career, through uh, consulting fellow embroiderers, uh, and the things that I've done in my own work in adding names and doing name drops and all that stuff uh, with an eye toward the knowledge you kind of need, the practices that are in place and the tools that make it make the most sense for you. So we're talking about efficiency in getting those names done. So I would love you guys to join live, share your experiences and methods. You can head over to ericcampbell.com or there's a bit.ly link, there's a QR code where you can catch a direct link to the take up tab that'll get you there with the full playlist. And the latest episode is always up directly in the page for you to click on. If you want to see it, you don't want to worry about the time zone, get in there and click get reminder or subscribe to the channel and you'll get that reminder on your time zone. Same thing for Facebook though, guys, on all of our shows, if you click get reminder, or you sign up to see it, it'll be in your time zone. You don't have to worry. Yep. Right there. QR code works folks. So jump out and <laughs> catch the take up. Uh, the only other thing I've got going on that I would like to kind of let people know about is uh, we're coming up to Impressions Expo Fort Worth. Oh my gosh, we're about a month out. Cannot believe that. So head over to ImpressionsExpo.com and you'll find uh, two of my sessions. I'm doing the long session on the day before the show for making small run patches. And then I've got a standard session during the show for uh, editing for non-digitizers. So just dealing with kind of the things that non-digitizers can do to save a design when they absolutely must. So either making small run patches in-house on your embroidery machine without adding additional technology to your stack necessarily and editing that everybody can do. Awesome. All right. Check all that out. Um, I'm going to share real quick and then we'll get to Terry's stuff here. Uh, right. September 5th through the 9th. Uh, of it's, I actually wrote in there 2023, but it is 2022. So <laughs> disregard that if you're looking at the notes, which that's just Terry and Eric. Um, but it, it's called the Five Keys of Marketing Workshop. And we've been doing this for the last two years uh, as part of the our success group members program. Um, but we've learned and grown and and we're going to really turn this into a, a more of a workshop style so we're going to spend five nights straight working together through a marketing process that's going to set people up for their best fourth quarter yet and uh, each day we're going to work through a different part of the process we're going to start with defining your ideal customer we're going to the next night kind of get into defining your brand i talked about those two things being the kind of concentric circles and then we're going to take that information we're going to narrow down to the best strategies to focus on for your business right so strategies like should i be spending time on facebook and doing facebook ads or you know is there a better way for me to go so picking those out because everybody always asks, oh where where should i 
where should I promote? Well, you should promote in the place that is right for your business. <laughs> that's the only answer to that question. Um, so anyways, uh, that's the third night is kind of picking out those pa strategies. And then the fourth night, we're going to set up a plan. We're going to have, you're going to leave with a whole 12 week roadmap of, of how you're going to market and get the most value for your fourth quarter, fourth quarter marketing dollars and time. And then the last night we're going to talk about then implementing those strategies and, and then revising along the way. So, you know, as, as you learn, throughout that process, you know, making improvements, as Eric talked about with uh, the Peter Drucker quote, right? We have to, <laughs> we can only manage what's measured. So um, that'll be the last night and it, it does include a full workbook and, and then just really plenty of actionable steps to move you forward and help you have a killer marketing plan for the fourth quarter holiday rush. Um, if you are an OSG member, you, you actually, this is part of your OSG membership. So those of you that are already OSG members, nothing to do here. But if you are not, you can register for this just as a standalone workshop. Eric's got the link on the bottom of the screen for the live viewers. It's oursuccessgroup.com forward slash five keys marketing. And uh, you can check that out. There is a VIP opportunity because we have an implementation call for members afterwards and you get access to that. So we can really get into the nuts and bolts of your particular marketing plan. So I'm super excited about that. Again, September 5th through the 9th. Uh, then the next thing for me will be, um, it's starting actually on September 1st, the Small Business Skills Summit. It's going to bring you 30 experts over 30 days. Uh, my session is on September 11th. And uh, I'm really excited to uh, to be part of this. But you want to check this out, go to osg.link forward slash skills summit. There's two S's in the middle of that. So make sure you get that if you're on the podcast side here. And my session is going to be about conquering fear and thriving. And then on the 15th of September, I am heading to Charlotte, North Carolina. And I get to be part of the Start Here Academy. I'm, I'm the MC. I'm the... Uh, herder of cats and and trying to make sure everything's going great but uh, we're, we're just gonna have a blast it's gonna be so cool to really kind of have an opportunity to learn from some influencers uh, there's some great sponsors of the event there is just going to be an opportunity to kind of network and and communicate with people that are in that startup mentality or you know even if you've been around for a while coming back to that startup mentality i talked about that earlier in the show that that's important for us so um check that out and um you can get more details of, about that at osg.link forward slash sha um and and i will put into the show notes there's code to waive the 25 dollars sign up fee i can't remember all the letters it's osg like n6 <laughs> but i don't remember all the letters off the top of my head so stay tuned but ask me if you, if you need it uh, most importantly and then uh, two, two more, or one more thing to kind of round it out. There's some other things, but I think I'm just going to leave one more thing here. Everything embroidery market is happening in Myrtle Beach, September 22nd through the 24th. Uh, everything embroidery And uh, on the 24th, the last day of the event, I actually get to be involved in four different. Um, educational opportunities. The first one is going to be on their vendor panel, which is always a ton of fun. And they're going to give us coffee and donuts. So that's even better. <laughs> you get, feed me and I'm a pretty happy guy. Um, but then uh, <laughs> after that, I will be uh, doing three seminars back to back uh, happening. Uh, one's pricing for profit and confidence. The other one's keys to starting a successful product decorating business. And then last but not least, finding your customers to stand out in a crowd. So um, don't, don't, don't have FOMO. Like I've had when I've missed some of these events, D just, just show up, just come see me in Myrtle beach, see me in Charlotte. Let's just make a whole road trip out of this thing. And, and we'll, we'll see you out there on the East coast. <laughs> All right, Terry, what about you, sir? Where, where can people get more of Terry Combs? Yeah, I'm leaving actually this afternoon for Chicago to do my complete screen printing business course this weekend. That event is sold out and my next event in Chicago will be November 5th and 6th. Uh, my next class in Phoenix at Workhorse Products is September 25th and 26th. Only two seats left. So uh, if you want to come to Phoenix, you should better get signed up pretty quickly because it's probably going to be gone uh, by maybe even over the weekend. Um, I'm going to be doing that same screen printing class at Equipment Zone in Franklin Lakes, New Jersey, which is in the New York City area, October 29th and 30th. Uh, September 9th, I'll be at Equipment Zone in Franklin Lakes, New Jersey for the DTG DTF training camp. And we're going to do that exact same event in Tempe, Arizona at Equipment Zone on September 23rd. September 30th, I'll be there in uh, Fort Worth at Impressions Expo with Eric. I'm going to be doing 
How to Make a Living as a Full-Time Garment Decorator. And October 2nd, I'll be there in Fort Worth doing training and motivating the best production staff in town. All my events are at terrycombs.com. Yeah. See, and I felt bad about the banners, so Terry got his own QR code. So there you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll style it later, but that goes straight to Terry's website. <laughs> so check that out, So guys. get your phones up there. All right. Get cool. your phones up there at terrycombs.com. <laughs> check out Tour Day. It's, it's, it's always a good thing to keep up with the massive schedule that this man manages to do. Hardest working man in the industry. Have, have you opened up the 2023 Book of Travels yet? Or oh, is it still I have it. Amazon I have it. It's, oh, it's, oh, here it is, the though. release is coming. Big like, book I think of I travel. Can, I can hear that envelope ripping in my heart. <laughs> it's, like, it's like taking your iPhone when you first get it and peeling off that little plastic. Oh, oh, yeah. See, that, that is the attitude you want. Don't have my attitude. Don't, see, that's the positive forward thinking attitude you want. <laughs> don't, don't be scared of that 2023 book. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, you guys. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, we appreciate everybody tuning in. I think we've come to the close of another show because uh, you guys need yeah. to follow Eric and I over. Just go over to ericcampbell.com uh, and, and you can check out. Uh, we're going to have the half here in uh, less than 10 minutes. So yeah. uh, make sure that you're tuned in for the half. You can go to ericcampbell.com or you can go to liveosg.com to check that yeah. out. So follow us over there. Uh, Eric, thank you so much. Great stuff. Way to way to bring up the topic. Way to just bring all this incredible information. And Couldn't do uh, without you guys. Awesome, as I knew, awesome as I knew, you and Terry would crush it today. So good job. <laughs> thank you. And we also want to thank Eric for not only being the guest today, but all the uh, production work he does and pushing all those buttons and making everything happen. <laughs> you couldn't actually see him, but he was actually juggling behind his back all at the same time. It was incredible. <laughs> I'm digitizing too. No, not today. <laughs> not, today. <laughs> not today. All right. Well, next week, Terry's actually going to be in New Jersey, uh, the, the great state of New Jersey. So uh, Eric and I will be, uh, so Eric will be back. I'm excited about that. Nothing personal, Terry. So I, I like it when you're here too. Um, <laughs> but when you can't be here, it's always great to have Eric along we're going to be interviewing uh richard king tilly this guy yeah. is a great guy just a heck of a character so um it's going to be a, a, a super fun conversation show. yeah going to be yeah. interesting so don't miss it we will be back at 10 o'clock central time next friday for that show all right yeah. until then uh, i'm terry combs he's eric campbell he's aaron montgomery and we are the two regular guys here we go we're out! <laughs> awesome. Thank you for listening to Two Regular Guys. Check out our website at tworegularguys.com. That's the number two, regularguys.com. You can also interact with us over at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash tworegularguys, or send us a tweet, twitter.com slash tworegularguys. And we have a YouTube page. You can find all that from our website, tworegularguys.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to spending some time with you again next week.